talking today about offensive religion. Have you, have you been exposed to anything where you're just literally insulted and offended and you're just going, in the name of religion, really? You're going to treat me like that? You're going to talk to me? You're going to act that way? Um, in the name of religion, just very, very, very concerning. And so what I want to do is I want to look and just glean just three areas today that we can look at and go, gosh, those horrible, horrible first century Israelites. No, that's not what we're going to do. What we're going to do is we're going to look at what they had done with this precious, precious truth that Abraham got. Abraham, walk with me for a minute, God said. Just walk with me. Count those stars. So shall your descendants be. The, the, sea, the, the sand. You will have more descendants than the sand. These are both uncountable and measurable. Abraham believed the Lord. And God credited that faith to him as righteousness. 430 years later, he gave them a system of religion to show them it doesn't work. You can't create something. You can't make rules and keep them. You can't go through life trying to do external religion as fallen people. It will fail every time. But you need, the world needs a massive object lesson. In comes the Mosaic Law. I will govern how you dress. You will not mix cotton and polyester. You will not eat scavengers from the bottom of the ocean because I am clean. Really glad that one's gone. I love lobster. You will not trim your beard. You will not do things on my day. I will govern everything. And I will get you to drop to your knees and ask for grace. They have this precious truth, and they twisted it. They took something precious and made it offensive. And that's what we're going to look at today. Offensive religion. Just to catch the context of where we are in Luke today, this is right after the triumphal entry. And, and I apologize, my calendar calculations, and this doesn't always work out. We looked at the triumphal entry on the, the proper, our calendar, but let's go back to it. We picture Jesus riding in on the donkey, right? Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're so excited, they completely ditch their own calendar, and they presume that this is the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles, right? When we're going all the way back to Eden, God himself would live with human beings. They are ecstatic because that means all their problems end, all the Romans leave, they get all the benefits of being good religious people, what they failed to realize, he was not fulfilling the Feast of Tabernacles. There was a massive feast about to go down in Israel. It was the Feast of the Passover. Jesus ridden on that donkey. He spoke only words of judgment because you didn't recognize me, he said, on the day of your visitation. And if you recall, going back to Palm Sunday, I'd spoke about it from his point of view, from God's perspective. What was he doing? Exodus 12, 6 says this. This is the Passover foundation. You are to take care of these lambs until the 14th day. They literally, they would select one, and they would live with it. Bond with that that will die for you. But it had to be without blemish to qualify to be the acceptable sacrifice. What Jesus Christ was doing when he rode in on that donkey was saying, here I am. I'm the final Passover lamb. True to the Old Testament, this lamb must go under observation. The devil is going to do absolutely anything and everything he can to keep him off that cross. In an attempt, and it seems silly to us, call an attempt of desperation, but here comes the barrage right at Christ. We've just got to find a way to disqualify him, to discredit him. Whatever the case might be, we have to stop the cross. So what we're seeing now is typically called, well, the beginning of a pericope of truth that I think the old King James used the word the passion of the Christ. This is the beginning truths of the passion week. Every component 
comes at Christ full speed to try and discredit him. And they all leave with their tail between their legs. Yeah, good luck with that. But again, let's not look and go, ha, huh, neener, neener, Pharisee, Jesus wins. Let's look inside. Let's look inside. I, I, I'm bummed we don't have the tech, and it probably wasn't the best time, but I am so excited to show you our future home. It is bubbling. Are we going to go in there and have any kind of attitude where we're offensive to the people we hope to reach? Let's flush it out now. Let's call it what it is. Let's flush it right out of our system and get to where we're a healthy, well-balanced, excited church. I was having a conversation about that. Like, how do you get a little bit younger to draw some younger families without upsetting maybe some of your older folks? And I just, you know what? I think anyone that has a little bit of our older folks is going to be so excited to see the next generation pick up from them and hand this message of grace off. I don't think I'm going to get barraged with upset senior citizens. Well, I don't know what they're going to call that. I don't. I think they're excited to see what God's going to do. But nevertheless, in all of us, there's maybe a component of some of this stuff. Let's flush it out. The three areas I want to look at today where religion becomes offensive is to look at the massive, massive, broad-scale financial corruption that flows from religion. It's bad. It's offensive. And I look back, and I don't know if it was unbiblical or it was just that I was the unbeliever in the crowd. But I remember going to a church before I was a Christian, and it was just like, is he talking about money again? Really? It, was just, it seemingly was over and over again. And so whatever we do, we want to do, saying, well, this is still biblical. And I think it was an interesting a comment someone made this week, I had never thought of it in this terms, like the biblical response is we ask God about our financial needs and then tell his people. And I thought it was so well said. Ask God, tell his people. But at the same time, if we're consumed with it, we're going to upset people. So I want to make sure today, is there any component of that in us? Financial corruption and religion, billion dollar a year industry, it's huge. And the second area where religion is offensive is when there is a profound and serious lack of grace. Plenty for me, none for thee. Here's the line in the sand. When you're ready to clean up, then join us. The lack of grace. Send people going 100 miles an hour the other direction. And the third area, politics. Politics. Probably heard the phrase before, don't talk politics and religion. I'm telling you, nine out of ten contexts, they can be the same thing if you're not careful. But Politics, are we going to do what's popular or are we going to stay true to the word? So we want to make our new home very welcoming, but are we going to hold to this or are we going to have those meetings and go, well, you know what? Make the crowds really, no. Through it all, we are not going to let the crowds, whoever we want to reach, dictate the terms under which we function. So let's take a look today at some offensive religion in the Gospel of Luke. Luke 19, 45, when Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling, saying to them, it is written, and my house shall be a house of prayer. You've made it a robber's den. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests, scribes, and the leading men among the people were trying to destroy him. How's that for some fond religion? We're going to destroy you. <laughs> wow. They couldn't find anything that they might do for all the people were hanging on to every word he said. On one of the days while he was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with him, elders confronted him. They spoke to him saying, tell us by what authority you're doing these things. So who's the one who gave you this authority? Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask you a question, and you tell me. Was the baptism of John, is it from heaven or from men? They reasoned among themselves, saying, well, if we say from heaven, he'll say, why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered and said, we don't know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Round one, Jesus wins. But let's go through that. What is the issue here? Was he upset about the bake sale in the foyer? 
No. No, it is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer. Actually, I think if you go to Matthew in the parallel passage, it says for all nations. And that was the idea. See, the church has been sent out. Israel wasn't sent out. They were to draw people in. They were drawn to that temple. They would encounter the living God where they could get a sacrifice, have their sin guilt transferred onto another, and leave with that sense of joy that I hope you leave here with every single week, knowing your sins are forgiving, knowing your sins went on to the acceptable substitute, and you just take that deep breath. And you feel so good to know I'm forgiven. So good. Right? That's what it was supposed to have been. They took the precious truth, and they twisted it. So they had people coming for the Passover from all over the place. And they would show up with various currencies and get ripped off at the exchange rate. I need to buy a lamb. I've got my 100 bucks. Well, the money we accept, you only got 20 bucks and the lamb's 85. Going to come up short today. Going to be a rough year for you. You're in trouble. Yeah, but, 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 but talk to the hand. Your money's no good here. Right? What are you doing? Or how about the guy that, that walks maybe the three days from Nazareth that Jesus and his family would walk? Oh, and he's got the lamb. I mean, he knows the lamb would be better as a steer or, or a stud, and, but it's, it's expensive. He needs it, but it's expensive. He knows he's just this wretch like the rest of us, and he's so excited to be forgiven. One more year, fresh start. Here's the lamb. Get the donkey. Get the kids. Here we go. We're going up to Jerusalem. We're going to be forgiven again. <sighs> We're going to walk the steps and read the hymns. We're going to do... Uh, but we get there, and leadership says, your lamb stinks. You have to buy one of ours. That's what they did. So the missionaries come and have artifacts from Africa or whatever the case may be. We're not violating any text. This was religious corruption, the likes of which is still going on. <laughs> religious corruption and lost sinners are kept at bay so other people can get rich. I think there's a lot of nonsense in the world, obviously. There's a lot of nonsense in me and it may be a touch in you. But I don't know of anything more corrupt than building a financial kingdom on the back of Jesus Christ at the expense of lost people getting saved. I shudder to think what that judgment would look like for those individuals. I shudder to think. In fact, for all that he accomplished, he was not a necessarily an overly divisive man. Although I think some of the German beer got to him, I don't know. But Martin Luther used, used, went nuts over financial corruption. And these things have ended, so I'm not being overly aggressive. But there's a phrase that he said. When a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Give us money. Can't tell you when. Can't tell you how much longer. Bring the bucks and we'll get your folk out of purgatory. And that is something they have repented of, and, and that was a dark area for our friends in the Catholic Church. But I want to make a point. This has been going on for generations and generations and generations. Are the Protestants any different? I don't know. I don't know. You've got guys traveling around in $28 million airplanes. I just, I, we're, I guess it's best just to look in-house. How about us? How are we doing when it comes to literally, okay, we have biblical financial needs. They have to be known. How does this thing? The church has to function. We have, there comes a point where, you know what, it is biblical to speak of financial needs. I take a paycheck from what you give. Let's call it what it is. I do. That's biblical. But if we get greedy with it, if we get corrupt do the same thing all over again. It might look a little less, but we can do the same thing all over again. And I am amazed, and I think it's an excuse. I do. I think a lot of people, when they target Christians as hypocrites or whatever, is they're just looking for any excuse, and money is so, so popular. Let's not give them one bit. Let's not give them one bit when it comes to the church and finances. We'll get back to normal bulletins soon. We'll put what we take in and what we spend. We ask you to vote on our budget. We're very transparent. You know what I make. I'll show you the paycheck stub if you want. It's, we're, we try and be as transparent as we can because we realize we run the risk. And typically with ministers, there's two areas where they get into trouble. And money. 
It's inevitable. Let's be extra, extra careful with those areas. The second area really goes on in verse 7. Excuse me, verse 47. He was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes, the leading men among the people, were trying to destroy him. They couldn't find anything that they might do, for all the people were hanging on to every word he said. I mean, they've been teaching people this absolute insane nonsense of generation after generation, and somebody shows up who loves them, who speaks words of encouragement to them. I mean, we've seen this in Luke. Then he takes that wayward we call prodigal son home, rushes to meet him with a signet ring. And we saw the big brother and the religious president. I mean, this is a theme that Luke has brought us back to over and over and over again. And then we see someone like Zacchaeus. Just needed the connection. And he was as repentant and as joyful as the next guy. People hung on his every word. So they got to silence him. Moving on into chapter 20 and verse 1. On one of his days... While he was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel. Have you spent any time listening to Jesus preach the gospel? <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. You might find yourself in John 1.12. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to be the sons of God. Receive, that's it? You just receive something? Somebody just throws it at you and you receive it and you're a son of God? Uh-huh. How about John 3.16? To a priest. The beautiful simplicity. John 5, 24. John 6. John 8. Over and over and over again. Nothing but grace and love and the forgiveness of sins. And they can't stand it. And so Big Brother, once again, right in his face, who do you think you are? We have these people towing the line. They give us their money. We have, who, you're, you just tell them it's free? Yeah, I do, because it is. Because in less than a week, I'm going to pay the full price for it. They went after him. Who do you think you are preaching the gospel? Those are our people. We control them. We profit from them. They're afraid. They're afraid. They're going to lose all their power, all their authority, all their glory, because this product of adultery, who claims to be God himself, is telling every one of these wretches they get to go to heaven for free. Who do you think you are? That's insane. There has to be a line. You can't just pile grace on people like that. They will go absolutely crazy with it. They will do everything unimaginable if you just tell them it's that free. They might. They might, yep they will come back with more adoration than all of the rules in the world can muster up. Let grace have its effect. It gets messy sometimes. Wait a minute, so you're telling me I believed in Jesus and I'm justified and I could still go do A, B, C, 1, 2, 3 and get to heaven? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Because you're going to do it anyway? What is the most powerful truth? Listen to this. Listen to this. I wonder if Jesus told him this. You're still going to sin. When you do, my grace will increase all the more. When sin abounds, my grace will superabound. Can you imagine this religious nuts? What authority? Who told you you could do this? Now, there's something fascinating going on in this text because Jesus turns it around about the whole authority. The reality is, even today, I guess you could go online, pay a fee, and ordain yourself. But any reputable, no, you can. <laughs> any reputable ordained ministry is going to have a body behind him that says, we are. We are ordaining this person. Back then, you needed another rabbi. So there's actually a lot going on when John endorses and baptizes Jesus. He's identifying with the people who are leaving Pharisaical Judaism and coming to this new movement. There's a lot going on, but he's also, in a sense being ordained. John was very popular, which is just odd to me in a sense because he wasn't exactly as lovable as Jesus in the sense of he let him have it. 
He's a Baptist. That's what they do, right? <laughs> no, sorry, I mean that. I was a joke for Frank because we talked about it the other day. No, there's a place for that. Oh, absolutely. He wanted them to repent, to change their mind and get back to the covenant they had, etc., etc. And so he asks us the question, was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? He's going to make these little weasels squeam. What are you going to say, guys? John's message resonated with the people. Resonated big time. Now, their motives are all over the place. I understand that. It was Messiah time, and he said it's time. They liked John because John said Messiah time. And Messiah time meant Romans would be leaving. And we get our land, our freedom, our peace, and our covenant. We've been waiting for this Davidic king to come. Just get him here. Clean these people out. So their motives were all over. You understand that? I understand that. Nevertheless, when you have such a popular message, excuse me, what are the crowds going to do with it? Oh, well, the guy's a total nut that people would turn on. So really, this takes us into our third area. Are we going to stay true? Right? Because there is a temptation to begin to compromise in certain areas. To look at it and go, well, if we did this, I don't even want to give an example. I just, I just, uh, but just come up with one in your own head. What, what, what would we do? What would be the ultimate compromise to fill all 158 seats at 82A, West Cochrane Street? I want to do it by being biblical, contemporary, uh, letting people come in and choose. Maybe they want to sit in the back and have a cup of coffee like they're at Starbucks and not feel like they're in a pew. I want to do everything, but everything we do, I go, wait a minute, biblical or unbiblical? Or, or kind of neutral. I mean, become all things to all people. So there's like component where you have liberty to, to make these decisions and do these things. But, well, if we just do this, we can't. We won't. We're not going to fear the crowds. So if, they, if we say it's for men, the people will stone us to death. I think they could have used a couple rocks upside the head myself, but that's not for me to decide. So they were convinced that John was a prophet. What are we going to do? We're going to compromise? To, we can't. We absolutely cannot compromise. And this is, this is the crazy thing. I actually think one of the most dangerous compromises we could make, it would, and it would be appealing, and most people would never know, is to add in this much works. This much self-righteousness. If you will turn from your sin and Clean up, you come on the other side of the line. And if I was to take a sermon every week and tell you, are you really saved? Because look at what this says. And then I turn around and I offer you the righteousness you want. See, any righteousness is hard to deal with. You're trusting in the righteousness gifted to you by another who got himself crucified for claiming to be God, very God. That's your source of righteousness. That is your only source of righteousness. You walk in his or you turn to a legalist. That's what the crowds want. Have you heard the testimonies? Well, I was a drunkard. I came home from the war, and I beat my wife, and I blah, 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 but now I've given my life to the Lord, and I've got baptized, and here's my two ministries I'm in. Served up righteousness on a platter. This is what I was, and now this is what I do. And to have some preacher come along and tell me that earns me Nothing. Zippo. They don't want that. They don't. Add one or two little nooks and crannies to this. Okay, I'm not that bad. I got mine now, and you're right. How are we going to work on this guy over here? It's very, very dangerous. We contribute in terms of our salvation, only the need for it. That's your contribution. The rest is him and his grace all the time. I get caught up. I started to get to my <laughs> application points here like we haven't made them. Yeah, somehow this just started over. We're full. We're full of tech today. What is our application? Let's walk back through some of this. So again, we could look at other people. I do, and that is my bend. And then people like John Rowe challenge me. 
not to be that way. <laughs> they really do. We can look at other people. Or we can go, what about compass? How, how, how do people, are, are, they, are we portraying our financial needs? Let's just go through these points one more time. We have them. We do. We have some ideas on some fundraisers. We talk them through as elders. We bounce them off each other. Is there anything outside of the lines here? Are we manipulating anybody? Do you realize you give what you want out of your own heart, out of the abundance of what you decide? I was challenged. Go back to tithing. That's the work. I won't do it. I absolutely do not see the Bible telling you to give 10% of your income. I think, should you decide, it seems to be a good starting point for a lot of people. It's your business. That is your business what you give. And I, I want to make sure that I keep reiterating that because nobody should come here and feel like I want 10% of their paycheck or that the church wants 10% of their paycheck. We believe in grace giving. Having said that, have we been entrusted with a cause? Are we supposed to live life like we're on a mission? I think we are. I, I found myself telling the story last night about this guy. He goes from Hamlet to Hamlet in the middle of the most God-forsaken jungle you could possibly imagine. Hamlet to Hamlet, one pair of clothes, that's it. And he teaches the word of God. See, people don't like to be in the village, so they just disappear where they can be with two or three families in these hamlets. And he saw that. He said, you know what my ministry is going to be? And so he wrote, sent a letter out, and it got to the support staff, and we contacted the missionaries who had long since left this village and said, here's what he wants. And the missionary explained to me what he was going to do with the little... So he says, Mike, would you do me a favor? I was working support before I moved into our village. Two foot by two foot, the thinnest plywood you could find. Cover it with chalkboard paint. Send in some chalk and charge my account for the air freight and the whole nine yards. And he began to tell me what this guy did, going hamlet to hamlet, teaching the word of God. He struggles with the chalkboard being bigger than two by two because he climbed a tree to catch a lizard for dinner, fell out, broke his arm, and he healed broken. Don't worry, he told me, charge my account. I still have money there. <laughs> yeah, right. You know how joyous it was to personally pay? That's the kind of giving we're talking about. We're like, no, no, I want to pay for that. This guy is doing what we all should be. He was reached by missionaries. <laughs> this is kind of funny, but... He was reached by missionaries. When they found a rat in their house, they would yell. And as a little kid, he would come up there and catch the rat and hold it by his tail and cook it over the fire. He's been eating rats and lizards and whatever he finds on the jungle floor his entire life. And, and we're going to run the risk of being financially corrupt when someone like that just wants fresh chalkboard and chalkboard paint to continue his ministry. Would that be biblical or unbiblical use of money to say, hey, we have a need here. Look, that is far removed. I get it. It is so far removed from us. It is piercingly convicting. It's all relative. I don't think you should sell everything and walk around your neighborhood with a chalkboard. I don't. But I think we can all learn from him. And I think when we look at a facility or whatever the case might be, we don't have a little boy who used to eat rats, and we don't have, we go, wait a minute. This could be the avenue to reach more souls. Who do I make my check out to? Because I don't want to be as excited. That's how we want to model giving. That's how we want to model giving. And we will not point to, we will not compromise the grace of God. In fact, I invite you. I invite you, and it's happened maybe twice in the last three and a half years, to get right up on in my spiritual face if you catch me hanging somebody's salvation on their conduct one bit. One bit. You get right up on my face and go, why did you use that word? Well, I'm a little concerned. Yeah. I'm, I'm in jungle mode today. I, there's a, there's a, a saying in Sino, they used to say, it's not for free. It doesn't work that way. That was their whole, their whole thing over there. There's two siblings, they, they exchange. The girl becomes a bride somewhere else. The boy gets the bride. I mean, everything. You walk in 
to the village with a stock of bananas. It's not your. Nothing is free. How hard it is to get through to people that the grace of God is free. And so yet we're going to take one little word because I can really get you squared away if I say, you know what? If you're really a Christian, your church attendance would be better. I crossed the line. If I'm sort of drawing from oh, Malachi. See, Malachi says, you don't rob God. You give him 10%. Malachi 3.10. I'm out of line. That's the old covenant. And I was talking about their crops and all that other stuff. Do you, you see how easy it might be to begin to compromise on these components? Or, Mike, would you do this with our building? If you do, we're going to draw a couple hundred people. And about, No, I won't. It's not a biblical use. Whatever the case might be, we're not going to compromise. We can't. But collectively, we should be looking at this text and learning how to avoid being an offensive religious structure. How do we avoid? You know what it comes back to? It comes back to going right back on that mission mindset. They should not be the only ones going on to mission mindset. We all should. Why? Where's our three L's? Live on a mission. There's been a cause entrusted to us. Will we live accordingly? Love like God. Love like God. And the sub point under that, that means you have to love without getting justice without getting justice and that sounds like what are you talking about here's a perfect example of what i'm talking about somebody calls up and they're so excited they've finally got enough money and they want a new screen door happened all the time i go out there i show them the brochure this is the one i want oh your price is fantastic when can i have it wonderful i'm treated like royalty this is fantastic i come back i always tell people you know what the tape measure never tells the full story not sure it's going to fit right or maybe somebody made a mistake in shipping and you watch that person turn. You're not meeting my need. You're not towing the line and they will turn on you and that love was not genuine. Not one bit. It was you're the man who's going to make my wife happy and put the screen door on and you screwed up this much, you're done. There's churches that teach people that way. I call them big brothers. We can't be that way. Live on purpose. Live with a purpose. Love like God. And when it hurts, when it hurts, you look forward to the resurrection of the dead. Two powerful conversations with Jim and Larry this week. Both of them are fairly resolved to their future. And to be able to talk about the power of the resurrection Make you be willing to pay any price at all, maybe even eat that rat. Okay, I get a little carried away. <laughs> Father, would you give us a heart to live on mission, to love like you did? And I know the greatest commission there is is to love, and it's probably the hardest because people are stinkers like us. So we need your grace to do that. Help us to live, love, and look forward. And it will all be so worth it to see these bright-eyed faces in heaven going, I was a total jerk, and you guys kept right on loving me. Thank you. And so we thank you, Lord. Would you do a work in our heart as we begin to prepare for the next chapter in this church? Would you flush out of us, start with me, flush out of us anything that's going to be offensive, rude, or unbiblical, that we might honor you, Jesus, and what you've done for us. Make us a people of worship, a people of adoration, and a people of appreciation for all that we have. We understand because of your free grace, we don't have to. I pray that all of us would land with a heart that genuinely wants to. Thank you for that, Lord. God's people said, Amen. Amen.